Yes, I think we'll make a start, even though maybe some other people might um, come and join us in a bit. So I, I have great pleasure in introducing um, Professor Stuart Stuart Hampton Lees um, today. He's Professor of Research and Form Teaching at the University of Central Lancashire. He's also the head of the Centre of the Research and Form Teaching. Um, he's also got lots of um, networks for lots of exciting events that are linked to this, and um, he's going to talk to you all about that today. Um, his background um, is actually um, English literature and Shakespeare in particular. Um, and like me, he's a former um, graduate of Warwick University, uh, so not very really far up the road. Um, and also, what I would like to say <coughs> is a big thank you to Narek here, um, because it, it's Narek who made those introductions and met you um, at Warwick University one day and um, persuaded you to come and talk to us. So um, thank you to Narek as well. I'm sure it's going to be a really enjoyable session. I'm going to Stuart now, so take it away. Thank you, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Thank you very much for, for, for making me feel very welcome. Um, um, you're, you're right, I did used to play for the other side. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and I actually lived around the corner from here. Um, I, I left in 1994, and I haven't been back since. This is my first time in this area uh, for, for, for over 20 years. And, uh, has changed a lot. I don't know if many of you were in Coventry at that time, but I think, yeah, I think it's fair to say it was a bit of a dump around here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, particularly as you've sort of get further down Golson Road, quite senior as well. Um, so yeah, I was impressed that the, gossip, the, the bookshop is still here. Uh, with, 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 with the same signage and people telling the same books. <laughs> but but I, think, I think the, the biggest difference I've noticed coming back to Coventry after more than 20 years is that you see the words Coventry University everywhere. Um, now I was late today because I went to where Coventry University was in my mind, which is behind the cathedral. So that's, that's, that's the Coventry University I, I used to know. Um, I remember queuing queue up there in a very small queue, paying two pounds to go and see a band in a bar called Oasis, just before they became, became really big. You know, so that, that's how far back I go. <laughs> um, I suppose that gives me some insight into what kind of institution you are, though, in your history, because I was sharing digs with the country polytechnic students uh, <coughs> at, at, through that period that the polytechnic I have to say, uh, I don't know, I, I suppose this can be said now, they weren't very happy about it. They were very upset that they were graduating from university when they'd made a specific choice to go to a polytechnic, which is interesting kind of sort of insight into the psychology of, of students at that point in time. But um, the, both the Coventry that I remember and the university I remember, actually, I don't, know, I, I, I don't see anything familiar, really. Uh, it's just everywhere you go, there's a big sign saying Coventry University, it seems very really confident, it seems Itself out there, um, completely different from the institution. I'm, so this is an institution that's gone through a tremendous period of growth. Um, it seems to be colonising the city, uh, and I've had the same experience at the University of Central Lancashire as well. That university has also been colonised in Preston, and I think well, well, you know th this is an experience right across the country, seeing universities really being a, a, an engine of growth. Um, so some uh, one of your deans told me that the Coventry University is close to becoming the biggest landowner. So it's been a tremendous uh, expansion, um, and I think you know with, with expansion comes all sorts of opportunities. And what I'm going to be talking about today uh, is, is, I think, really cuts. I hope cuts to the heart of, of, of what a university is, and what it does, and what it aspires to be. And that is how you manage the relationship between research and teaching. Um, I've been on quite a, a journey with this, uh, going right back to my days in Coventry. I, 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 you might have guessed already, I've come through a very traditional academic career. I started off uh, uh, doing a PhD at a traditional university, and then going into a, a lectureship, and then sort of working my way up to, 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 to a chair through publications. Um, that isn't my only model of, of, of an academic, though. I, I have the good fortune uh, to be married to somebody who come from a very different route. Uh, my, my wife is a senior lecturer in publishing. Uh, she wasn't a senior lecturer in publishing when I married her. I had no idea that she would become an academic, and nor did she. Uh, she went into uh, publishing as, as a business. She became developed a professional identity. And it was only when we'd been married for, for more than 10 years that she came into 
at the university and started setting up an academic course. She never imagined that that was something that she would do. So she's, she's coming to the university through a completely different route. And I know that um, I, whenever I address audiences, particularly in universities like uh, Central Lancashire, where I come from and Coventry, there's always going to be a, a, a mixture of people who come in from different routes. So I'm, I'm assuming that some of you would have be, be like me, some of you who sort of started off doing a PhD and have never really been let loose on the real world in any meaningful way because, frankly, that would be a really bad thing if anybody let me loose on the real world. Uh, but there'll be others who, who've actually made a career in, in a profession of coming to the university and teaching from your experience and you, you've done the PhD later in life or would consider doing the PhD later in life. Does that fairly describe the sort of links that we've got? That's good and I think it's important to hold on to that. Because that word research is such a loaded word, such a contested word. It means so many different things. I mean, I think you know we could come up with a definition that we would all agree on, original um, contribution to knowledge, you know, the classic PhD definition. But what does that actually mean? What is original as opposed to something that's unoriginal? Those are things that are, are hugely varied right across the sector. And certainly I've, I've been in rooms before, maybe have a much more um, uh, harmonious and friendly university, but I've certainly been in universities before where, where people, you know, for example, from the hard sciences, simply wouldn't recognise what somebody from, say, choreography would do as research, and, and vice versa as well. So, you know, there, there's a huge variety of what we define as research. But for me, what it is fundamentally is how we engage with the outside world in our disciplines and our professions, and how we bring that engagement into the classroom. That's a much broader definition than you would find for the REF, for example. Uh, but I think it includes so much more than simply uh, peer-reviewed refereed articles. It includes, it's what makes you an expert in your subject. And I think this is a fundamental dividing line between, uh, between uh, university education and other forms of education. And that's going to kind of be the, 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 the theme for my uh, sort of the start of this workshop. Um, just explain what I'm going to do before I go on any further. Um, I've got two things I want to do. We've got two hours. We can use those two hours loosely, so you know, if, 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 if you want to move the discussion elsewhere, we can. Um, but for the first part, I'm going to be talking about the importance of research and form teaching and developing that, that idea of, of researchers as your expertise. Um, and uh, uh, the second part, I'm going to be looking at what we've done at the University of Central Lancashire uh, some of the things that we've done will be things that you've done, some of the things will be, that we've done will maybe provoke ideas, it might be that some <coughs> things that we've done wouldn't work here, but I think it would be a useful starting point for thinking about how research and teaching can work together. Um, I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all model for this, you know, there, there aren't simple sort of uh, uh, easy fixes. I think it's something that, that each of us as academics has to solve in our own way or conceptualise in our own way. Um, I, was, uh, I was talking to your, to your deanery before. I think it's a wonderful word, by the way, that you introduced me to, deanery, a collective noun for deans. I think that's a fabulous word. Um, uh, and uh, they, they were explaining that they had a very close relationship with uh, a very good friend of mine called Mick Healy. I don't know if that he's spoken to you before. And my first response was, well, why do you need me then? Because Mick is the superstar in this particular field and he's been a great supporter of mine. Um, whenever he describes research informed teaching or, or, or undergraduate research, he always maps it out. So if you've ever seen Mick give a talk, he's probably put a grid up and it's a map. And there's a good reason for that, because he's a geographer. That's what geographers do, they, they, they make maps. Um, uh, and another good friend of mine, who I don't know if you've come across him or not, is guy called uh, Professor Mike Neary, who, who was at uh, Warwick for a long time and then moved over to, to Lincoln. Um, he, he, he always talks about the student as producer. So if he was giving you a talk, there would be like a, a, a sort of um, futurist style 1930s poster uh, uh, and, and lots of kind of 1968 style political slogans uh, uh, talking about it the revolutionary politics of our students working as producers of knowledge. But he's from a political science background. So he's sort of going back into his own discipline and finding concepts and ideas within his own discipline to describe that relationship between uh, teaching and research. And that's what I encourage you to do as well. I mean, there are lots of models out there. And, and both Mick uh, Healy and, and Mike Neary are just one of a number of people who have attempted to do this. But I think the most powerful way to start conceptualising research and teaching <coughs> is to go back to your discipline. Because for me, we are always um, uh, dealing with that tension between research and teaching. 
It is something that I think has um, practical significance. I think there's an ethics to it as well. And I think there's also a politics. Um, I just want to sort of briefly spend some time on that, because I think it's very important. Um, I said before, I will describe research as, as, our, as, as, as what our expertise is. I think it's very important that when we're teaching students, as higher education establishments, that we're not just simply giving um, uh, uh, information that is received and agreed and put into a textbook and then passed on. I think that's, it's vitally important that as higher education institutions, students are coming to us and being taught by people who are not just expert in their fields, not just aware of what is going on in the field all the time and aware of the dynamic uh, sort of structure of knowledge, we're actually part of that conversation as well. And that seems to me is when research informed teaching is at its most powerful. When students, first of all, recognise your role as a teacher in developing that national and international agenda for knowledge. But also, and this is where I think it becomes really powerful and really transformative, when the students themselves start to become part of that process and start to be part of that production of knowledge. I think it's important because it shows that uh, knowledge is provisional, that there is always a sense in which the curriculum is always changing. And I think that's important both from the student's academic point of view, in terms of understanding the subjects that they're studying, but also in terms of their you know, sort of future employability, that the world changes, that our understanding of the world changes, that the questions that we need to ask of the world change, and that the answers that we get change. Um, I mean, we, my, 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 my time at university was mentioned earlier by, by, by the uh, who was also at university at a similar time. I mean, gosh, we didn't have Microsoft Office when we were at university. I mean, the world changes completely. And in some ways, the degree doesn't will only prepare you for that changing world if it prepares you intellectually to be responsive to changing things. So I think research and teaching do need to go together. There is a practical reason why. Many of us start off as PhD students. Many of us have to do a PhD as part of uh, our academic development. How do you balance those research needs against your teaching needs? I mean, in terms of my own personal journey, I, I found that I was recruited, you heard I was a Shakespearean. Shakespeare is a tough master, by the way, if any of you uh, have, have, have ever studied his plays. It's very difficult if you're researching Shakespeare to really research anything else. And I was recruited to the University of Central Lancashire as, as a lecturer. The first thing I was uh, teaching was Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. <laughs> it's a personal thing. I know people love Jane Austen. I'm sure many people here love Jane Austen. I hate Jane. <laughs> <laughs> really, really can't stand Jane Austen, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've probably got sympathy for a lot of people now. But, uh, and particularly Northanger Abbey, I really can't stand Northanger Abbey. <laughs> but anyway, that was, that's what I was doing. And it was very difficult for me, and I think this is something that a lot of academics will identify with. It's very difficult for me in the first two or three years of my teaching to really establish myself as a researcher. Because I was doing five lectures a week, I was creating new courses, uh, you know, I was suddenly finding I was uh, I was the new guy, and said, what do you do with the new guy? Give them all the rubbish teaching that you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and, and you know, that, that, that stalled me for, for, for a good two, two or three years, and then I had to kind of restart my, my, my research uh, uh, career again. Um, I think it's really important that we make sure we have ways in which research and teaching can be balanced. I've spoken to so many people, I mean, I'll, I'll do events like this, and I'll hear one thing in kind of open discussions we'll have. And then people will be taking me aside afterwards and saying, actually, I, I've never got to talk in my research area. And I find that really difficult, because that means I essentially have to be two people. You know, I, have to, I have to be the expert in the classroom, but I'm also trying to develop my research in another area. So I think, you know, for just pure practical reasons, we need to make sure our teaching and our research are being aligned. Um, I said there was an, an ethical side to this as well, and I'm a strong believer in that. I'm a strong believer that um, we are some of the luckiest people in the country because we get paid to indulge our own curiosity. You know? uh, and you know, I, know, I, know, I know some people don't feel lucky being academics, so I've always felt being lucky. You know? If somebody actually pays me to read Hamlet, what better job could you get? Um, but I think what comes with that is that we do have an ethical responsibility. Our students, through their loans, are paying for this, through their taxes, are paying for this, you know, so somebody's paying for it. That, that, that research should then have some kind of positive impact on the world around us. It should you know, have some kind of uh, uh, social function. And of course we do that through, through impact and working with external clients, but the way we have the most impact is in the classroom. Uh, 
So I think from an ethical point of view, it's really important that the work we do as researchers, not every single bit of it, I'm a great believer in blue skies thinking, but the majority of work we do as researchers has some kind of benefit for the students that we teach who, who sustain the university. Um, not everybody agrees with that, and I know the impact agenda has been particularly controversial in the sector, but I've always felt that that was a really important um, rationale for bringing research and teaching together. I think the, the third thing that I, that I think is highly relevant for institutions like UCAN and, and Coventry is that there is a huge political agenda underlying this. Um, for me, holding on to the idea of the university goes back to this idea that we are experts in our subject, that we own our own curriculum, that we define our own curriculum. To me, that is what defines us as a university, what defines us as a higher education system is what defines the capstone of an educational process that begins when students are four and ends when they're, they're for most of them, when they're 21. Um, there are lots of people in, in government uh, and in the establishment who would like to change that. And this is something that's been a very persistent theme uh, in higher education, more or less since 1992, when institutions like UCLAN and Coventry became universities. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the debate about whether there should be teaching other universities that do no research hasn't gone away. Um, and I was a, at a dinner um, at the British Academy just in July, um, led by Charles Clark, who was a for, for, former minister, uh, and with uh, a, a number of people from this from, from the sort of university establishment, the higher education establishment, including people from Biz, uh, and, and people, vice chancellors of various universities. And that was the topic. Should the sector be carved up? to teaching only, research only universities. It hasn't gone away uh, and it continues to be a pressure. And just over the last 10 years, we've seen greater concentration of research funding in a smaller number of institutions. That's not gone away either. Um, but just to give you an instruction, I, I collect some of the more insane things that are said in, 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 in this debate. This, this, this one's always, it's, it's about three years old now, it's always struck me as being particularly insane. It's one I wanted to share with you. Um, this is from, this is from a, uh, a, a, a report from Centre Forum, who are kind of a liberal democrat think tank, very close to Nick Clegg, so they're very close links with the government. Um, and this was a proposal, basically, to, I mean, I don't want to alarm you, this proposal didn't go anywhere, because it's obviously the same, but it did excite a lot of interest at the time. Um, and it sort of showed you the kind of thinking and debate, or the quality of debate that goes on around this area. Um, she proposed that research institutions, most obviously those within the Russell group, but including uh, some others, so i.e. not us, <laughs> <laughs> just in case you're one, whatever your vice chancellor might say, um, would focus on research and teaching, whilst regular institutions, that's us, we're regular institutions, would focus primarily on teaching. Now, costs would be significantly lower of the latter here, so you're cheaper. <laughs> Um, since staff and facilities could be, be used more efficiently, for example, by offering degree courses for over two years. Yes, I know, we're going to go into deep insanity at the moment, aren't we? Um, but it gets better. Um, to ensure quality, a set of standardised courses and exams will be designed by research institutions and other expert bodies. So you wouldn't design your own curriculum, it would be done up at Warwick. And we can see they're itching to do that as well. To be delivered through a collegiate type arrangement in teaching based institutions. And this is my favourite bit, and this is where you might actually start to see some benefits to this. Exams would be marked externally, organised by those designing the courses rather than those teaching them, as is the case now. So Warwick, you're going to do all your marketing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, maybe there's some benefits to this. Um, no, I'm, I'm not saying that the government is seeking to do this. This report sort of disappeared. Um, but it was produced, it's the kind, and it does reflect debate that I hear all the time, you know, that the institutions like ours should be teaching only, that we should focus on what we're good at, that we shouldn't research, that that should just be, you know, well, why, why, why are we paying people in Coventry University and uh, Preston Poly and, and places like that to go and do research? Um, so, you know, we can't pretend that this isn't a real debate, that this isn't something that is being discussed quite a lot at the very highest levels in, in the people who shape higher education policy. And I think that's why it's very important for us to demonstrate that research isn't just something that we do to improve our ref score, isn't just something that we do to improve our league table position, 
And it's something that we do because we believe that research has a fundamental benefit to our teaching, that it improves the quality of the student experience, and it extends our opportunities for students as well. I think it's vital that we hold on to the idea of university and avoid being characterised as these uh, regular universities that are not even capable of doing their own marking. <laughs> Such a low opinion of us. It's a sobering, it's a sobering uh, sort of insight into, into uh, the mindset of, of the Westminster elite. Um, and this is something that's equally shared across all parties, by the way. When I was talking to Charles Clark, obviously the uh, Labour Minister, he would very much agree with this. Um, so, there's practical reasons, ethical reasons, and political reasons, I think, for holding on to this. Um, what I wanted to do, uh, to sort of to sort of take us into to, to the next bits of, of my presentation. Before we go there, I, I, I wanted to think about how we became researchers and the kind of journey that we went on. Because as hard as it is to imagine, once upon a time, all of us were undergraduates. Uh, it might seem a very long time, it certainly seems a long time ago for me. Um, one of the sort of features of higher education, uh, in British higher education, is that most of us at some point probably did some kind of research project when we were undergraduates. If you didn't do that, that probably means either that you were an unusual university, and there are quite a few of those, uh, or, or, or you studied elsewhere. Certainly uh, in other countries, this is, you know, the, the dissertation, the final year project is quite unusual. Um, so it, it, it is quite a distinctive feature, feature of British higher education. Something that's typically done in the third year, often the last semester of the third year, and it's, it's really kind of like the capstone of the British degree. I wondered if we could sort of go back in time a bit to when we did your dissertation for your final year project <coughs> and, and just try and sort of remember what you did. I would like if, if, you're, if you're not with somebody already, just sort of in twos or threes or, or whatever seems like the most. I'm not, I'm not a great believer in moving people around and where, where you wanted to sit was probably where you're best at. But just uh, try and remember, I mean, if you didn't do a final year project, or dissertation, and it's actually quite interesting to know why you didn't, whether, whether you felt that disadvantage in some ways. But if you did do a final year project or dissertation, an independent project in your final year, what was it? What was it about? Okay. Uh, how were you supported in it? And did you do anything with, with that? I'm really interested in you know, how, how you sort of approached that dissertation, whether it's something that, that people told you about a long time in advance, or whether it's something that was just sudden, suddenly appeared. Scarily in your third year, you know, to actually do something with it. So they, 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 they set up the centre and they appointed me, and I was a lecturer there already. Um, uh, and they, 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 the budget was about a million pounds uh, to spend on research and form teaching initiatives. So I, I had a great advantage, and I had, a, I had a, you know, research and form teaching wasn't anything that was particularly recognised within the, the university. When I first went around doing workshops like this, I got quite a lot of hostility initially. Um, uh, from the, well, you know, we do that anyway, it's obvious, to the, uh, you know, this is a terrorist called appalling, and, and all sorts of names, you know, that, that you get where, when you're trying to introduce an initiative for the first time. Um, now it's really different, we actually call ourselves a research and foreign teaching university, so I think we probably did something right, we managed to change minds uh, over that period of time. But I, I had money to spend, so I had to create some big projects. Um, one of the first projects that, that we did, and I still think it's probably the most successful one we did, and it's one that is relevant to you because, because your, uh, your dealer was talking to me about it at lunchtime, saying this is something that they would like to do, which is create a summer internship project. Uh, um, so we, we created this scheme, um, and we, we funded initially around about 50 places. Um, uh, and what this did was to place undergraduate students in research projects over the summer period. So for 10 weeks, um, and undergraduates would compete for this, they would uh, work with, 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 with a researcher on a defined research project. And we, from the outset, I said there had to be a high quality research project. So it had to be something that would be recognised in its field as high quality. So obviously, like a, a journal article, for example, or, or uh, fields are so varied that, 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 that definition of high quality research would vary. But not just a student with an interesting idea, but actually working with a professor or, or, or a top researcher on a research project. Um, we called it uh, Eurus, uh, the Undergraduate Research Internship Scheme. Um, we've run it every every summer since, and it's been very, very popular. Staff compete for it, so the first round is that staff put projects in, and we get loads of applications every year, far more than we can fund, and we select the, the best ones. 
Uh, we use several criteria. The, the quality of the research is one of them. We also make sure that students have a meaningful role within that research project. So one of the things we wanted to avoid from the outset was creating situations where it's a good research project for the students making the tea and doing the filing and things like that. We wanted to avoid that, that, that kind of scenario. Uh, we, also, um, we also paid students, um, which, which was good actually, because then legislation came in which meant we had to pay students, so we already, already solved that problem. We paid them like a, a minimum wage fund, so that, that, that cost roughly, with on cost, about two and a half thousand pounds per student, um, which might sound like a lot of money, uh, but actually, uh, in terms of the investment, this is where we began to persuade our university that this was something worth investing in. In terms of the investment, you get much more out of a single internship than you do from, say, a sabbatical. The sabbatical will cost 12,500, you get a couple of research outputs. For 2,500, you get a research output, you get excellent experience for the, uh, for, 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 uh, for the student. Um, and, you know, it, it, it creates uh, a, um, a momentum around the research and from teachers. This is like a, a beacon project. Professors were, and, and researchers were going back to their department afterwards and saying, we have a fantastic experience, we need to do more of this, we need to bring research into teaching in more creative ways. Um, uh, we've sponsored o well over 300 <coughs> outputs, and that changes every year. Um, uh, we, 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 uh, our, our REF submission, for example, uh, which has just come back, a lot of those were generated or supported through this internship scheme. Um, one of the things that surprised us from the outset was we had expectations from the scheme, but all the students on it massively exceeded those expectations, and things started happening that we didn't think would happen. Uh, one of which was that um, uh, staff were co-publishing with their students. So actually, quite a lot of the undergraduate students ended up having their names uh, on, on the author list of the articles that were being published. We never expected that. Um, what we really didn't expect was students publishing in their own right. Um, because, I mean, nobody told them they couldn't. So they did. So they, you know, we had students who just submitted articles to, actually in some cases, quite good journals, and being accepted. Um, so you know, uh, what, what, what I learned, I guess, as, a, as an academic, um, is that once you take students, particularly your very best students, outside of the curriculum, there isn't actually any limit on what they can achieve. There's no rule that says, for a second year or third year student, you can't produce research that's good enough to get into a journal. And we've proved time and again that you can challenge those hierarchies and boundaries all the time. Um, I, I had one professor ring me up. Um, uh, he, he was kind of both upset and pleased at the same time because he, he was in pharmacy and there's this very there's a conference that's very difficult to get into. He appointed the first year in, as an intern. And uh, he, he said, you know, she, she's managed to get an abstract through to this conference. Oh, that's good. He said, yes, it's good, but my abstract was turned down. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, we, 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 were, we were really absolutely astonished by the, by, the, uh, by the outcome of this scheme. It's been like it's something now the university feels very proud of. We're not the only university to have a summer research internship scheme. I think the, the, the idea goes right back to, um, to, to, to America in the 60s, MIT launched uh, something like this and it's, it's now actually very common if, if, if any of you are connected with uh, American un universities you should go back and see if they've got an undergraduate research office because many many do have an undergraduate research office and they sponsor these kinds of um, uh, internships all the time and they're, they're, they're becoming more common in this country too so I was really pleased when I was, I was at, at lunch today when I, when I hear that there are, there are there is talk about creating something here because I think in terms of the most immediate Thing you can do to really sort of um, put turbocharge your research and form teaching is to create some scheme uh, along these lines. Um, the other benefit, again, we didn't do this deliberately, it wasn't a big strategy, it just didn't happen, was that we found that a lot of these students were, were going on into postgraduate research course. <coughs> um, 70% uh, of, the, of the students who, who, who go through these schemes end up doing a postgraduate research uh, degree, most of them staying with us. Um, some don't, we never mind that, it still helps our daily figures if they go off and do a PGR degree somewhere else. But most of them stay with us. And for the same reason, when we talk about the dissertation, but this was, you know, somebody doing a research project, developing a relationship with a, with, with a researcher, and then that relationship turning into a, into a PhD relationship. Um, 
since we, we began this, um, we, we doubled our PGR population. Uh, we, we, we had a PGR population. Actually, when I started, we had a PGR population of about 300. We now have 800. Uh, so we've massively grown and rapidly grown. This is why I'm also now heading graduate research at the university. Because we figured we were doing something right. Um, so you know, in terms of growing the sort of the research student side of things, it also has massive benefits. So this has been a really good scheme for us, and it's uh, continually still funded 50% from research funds and 50% from teaching funds. You know, the, the, the million pounds have been long gone. You know, that, that, those are halcyon days when, uh, where, 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 where we were measured on, on whether we spent enough money or not. Um, but, but these days, the university is very supportive of this. And I think it's something that we should consider and look at as well. It's not the only project we've done, though. Um, actually, we've done loads. I'm only going to talk in detail about two. This was one. The other thing we did, and I think this goes back to a point that, uh, that uh, somebody made earlier, I think it was you, that you feel you pull all your work into the dissertation and then it just gathers dust, is we, we set up our own journal for undergraduate students. Um, we called it, um, this is it. Um, we called it Diffusion. Um, you wouldn't believe how, how long we spent on just coming up with names for these things. It was, uh, um, we called it Diffusion because uh, if you go back into the past of, of, of the University of Central Action, this is probably got a similar history as well. Um, before a polytechnic, we were Harris College, and before the Harris College, we were the Preston Institute for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. So <laughs> I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm one of you who thinks that we should go back to that <laughs> title, because I think it's a really good title. Um, uh, it's also, it's, it's, I don't know if any of you read Charles Dickens, it was the, the, the inspiration for Brad Grimes' school in our times. Um, but uh, it's not something we boast about, unfortunately. <laughs> But yeah, so we, we called it diffusion. So I, I, I like that idea that you know that, 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 that this was a way of disseminating uh, good work, and that we characterised it as outstanding work by new grad students. And again, this is a multidisciplinary journal published online and in hard copies. Um, I was originally going to be co-presenting this with, with a colleague of mine, who unfortunately wasn't able to make it. And if she had been here, she would have been carrying a suitcase with all the diffusions in it. But so, since she couldn't make it, I, I didn't have enough room in my suitcase to bring any. If anybody's interested, I'm happy. Um, but th this has been, again, another good way of, of uh, harnessing uh, and celebrating the undergraduate work that's done, not just at dissertation level, but, but at every level. Um, so we, we don't have any rules on what can be submitted, only that it has to have been through a, a course board first, because it would be very embarrassing if you publish something and you failed. Um, uh, uh, we, we, one of the questions we had right at the start, I think one of the very first questions that was asked of us was, how do you create a peer review process for an undergraduate journal. We wanted it to be an academic journal, we wanted to have academic rigour, uh, but at the same time we wanted it to be accessible. Um, uh, you might not, you may or may not be aware of this, but the uh, probably the biggest undergraduate journal in this country is published by, by the other team up the road, it's called uh, Reinvention. Um, and they're, they're one of the few undergraduate journals run by universities open to anybody. So, so our journal is only open. <coughs> it's, a, it's an internal journal, but, 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 but reinvention is open to all students. And um, they, they have a very high quality bar, they have a very rigorous peer review process, and the, the, the result of that is they, they, they have a crazy um, rejection rate, something like you know, <coughs> one out of 27 papers is published. Um, and I thought, I didn't want to spend the rest of my uh, career writing to hundreds of students and didn't want to publish their work. So I thought we needed to come up with a, a more efficient system. So what we did instead was a, a lecturer recommend system. So um, a, a, a lecturer will, will spot a, a potential essay, you know, you know, one of your first class essays from one year, and then recommend it to us. There's a form for that. Uh, on that form, we don't publish or republish verbatim stuff that's been submitted to the coursework. On that form, the, the lecturer also has to say, this is what we would do to make this publish. This town. And then the lecturer works with the student afterwards to turn it into something that's published. So that's the, that counts as the first stage of the peer review, the, the lecture is the first stage. And then we, we created a college of undergraduate students who, and we trained them in peer review. So that was good experience for them. And postgraduate students wanted to be involved in this too, so we included those too. So uh, that also is part of the academic process, a very important part of the academic process. So we, we created this peer review structure. We, we worked very hard to make sure that we were cross-disciplinary, that, we, that we, weren't, 
Because I, I think sometimes if you set up a journal, it can just sort of lump towards one particular discipline, uh, or cluster towards one particular discipline. Um, I know some people have to go at 3 o'clock, so if, if anybody is trying to sneak out now, you might as well just go. <laughs> um, uh, where was I? Oh, diffusion. Yeah, so um, this, this created a very effective system for us. It meant that we were accepting most of the papers that we got because already they'd, been, they'd already been quality reviewed. And it meant that they were good. we had sciences, we had, um, we had people from business studies, we had people from English literature and psychology. Uh, so again, you know, it's, it's become a, a popular uh, initiative around the university, and now schools have their own sort of school-based committees to generate material. We're, we're just uh, publishing volume eight, um, so we've got eight years worth of material now in this journal. And again, it's been a very good experience for the students. And I think what, what <coughs> really comes back to is a very important part of research that we're all engaged with, but our students are very rarely engaged with, and that's dissemination of research. And that's one of the things that, uh, that, that, that I really... You're right there. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Got to it gives me a chance to have a drink of water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another project, which I think is a very good way of starting to drive forward, and now, now we, um, uh, we've, we've started to find ways of integrating that within the curriculum. Um, I know you have a, I believe you have an undergraduate research conference here. So, is that right? One of the course teams. One course team. Yeah. 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 Not vast. Not vast. Well, you know, we, we, we've been expanding now. Uh, at the end of the internships, for example, we have a poster exhibition. So we get everybody into a room uh, after the 10 weeks. It's a condition of the internship that you produce a poster, even if you're in a discipline that's going, what the hell's a poster? Uh, which, which we get sometimes. So we, we, we make everybody do a poster. Um, they stand in front of their posters. We get, we get our vice chancellor along. We get our deans and the pro vice chancellors. Everybody we can who, who, you know, part of this is political, trying to make sure that we are continuing to, to, to promote the cause. And, you know, we, and it's open to students. It's open to, to everybody. And it's a really frantic couple of hours, and it's really dynamic. And the students get to talk about their research, and um, we give them we prizes at the end for, 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 for the best poster. And that's really where you start to see it come together. In those moments when you are disseminating your research, when you are articulating what was significant about your research, that's when I think the learning really starts to happen. And, uh, and that's, that's part of the curriculum. I mean, I know some of us do class presentations and things, but it's not quite the same. Um, so with Diffusion, we have a way to disseminate research to a published form, and students get to, to, to go through the peer review process, and through the internships, students get experience research, and then disseminate that research through their poster presentations. And what some of our colleagues have been doing, has been working on embedding this as well, is start to include those kind of things into, into their assessments. So it can be a, an assessment to put what's on the board for Diffusion, for example. Uh, one very innovative um, uh, project that we've been working with and we're trying to roll out across the university, is um, uh, one team has uh, made it a compulsory part of their dissertation. They give a presentation of their dissertation. And they've also created a, a module um, for, for a smaller number of students, which is around running an academic conference. And they put those two things together. So they have an academic conference at the end. And it's, it's, it's run by the students who get academic credit for doing so. Um, and then the students who are required to give a presentation as part of their on people who present it. It's, it's a great kind of virtuous circle. And the, the, the students who are involved in it are, are really energised by that because they're not just getting to find out about their research, they're getting to find out about other people's research as well, which is the other thing that stimulates us as academics. That's what we don't do enough in dissertations. You're kind of focused on your own work and not necessarily finding out what other people are doing. But even more importantly, they gave second year students, first year students, an opportunity to see what dissertation is all about. You know, and to hear and talk to people who are actually doing the dissertation to demystify some of that process around the dissertation. So all of these things, you know, these kinds of the beacon projects that we've, 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 we've set off have been stimulating minds. And that's really all, all I see my role as uh, both at the university and here, is just to say, this is the things we can put on the table. But what 
do you do about it? What can you do about it? Because you have all the creativity and resources and enthusiasm to, to, to solve these questions for yourself. Um, we didn't just stop there though. Um, things kind of took on a life of their own because we started to we started to sort of move out of the university. And something I was very keen to do um, uh, early in my career was to bring together a lot of the activity that's going around in the country already in this area and, and find some way of networking it. Because it's one thing to present to your classmates, it's one thing to present to your tutors and, and, and to your VC, but to actually go out of the institution. That's when, you, that's when it stops being something that's kind of like toy research and something that can become real research when it's being acknowledged by an international community. Um, one of the first things I did was um, look for a conference elsewhere. Um, and I, I found this through the, the very traditional research method of logging onto google.com and putting in uh, undergraduate research conference. I should imagine that's how Merrick found me, actually. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, right, I found this thing called the National Conference on Undergraduate Research. I've never heard of it before. I don't, has anybody here heard of it? No? no? Okay. Uh, if you want, there's a website, it's ncurve.org. Um, and um, I, I immediately became very interested in it. This is uh, it's, it's the National Conference, it's the US National Conference, it's an American based uh, conference. It's been running for, the next year it'll be celebrating its 30th year, so it's been running for 30 years. And I, I managed to get some funding to take some students to it. Um, and this is, this is very relevant to you because the, the man who funded me uh, was, was a guy called John Quirk. Um, I don't know if that name means anything to you, but he's now uh, at um, this place. So I think he's an running he's, he's the guy who was appointed as assistant BBC for the international office. Yeah. So, a door that he might be worth knocking on. Um, I don't know whether he would certainly recognise the agenda and recognise the benefits of it. Um, so um, I, I, I took a party of students, and, and it's, a, it's a big, I had no idea what I was getting into it actually, but it's like, like a lot of conferences, you have to submit abstracts, um, and those abstracts are peer reviewed, you then get found, find out who, who students are, which students have been accepted for the conference, and then you take them. And we went in, in April, this was back in 2010, I think it was, uh, in Montana, um, in the Rockets. And it was the most extraordinary academic experience of my life. Uh, you know, I'm not, not exaggerating. There were nearly 4,000 students at this conference presenting. 4,000 students presenting over two and a half days. Um, they, 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 they do, you know, it's just traditional sort of conference structure. They have plenaries. Um, there are actually only a few universities that they can go to with this conference because they need a plenary that can, uh, hold, that can hold 4,000 people. Which, you know, there aren't that many places around, so they tend to go to places like Montana, which have big open spaces, and you, can, you can build big lecture theatres there. Um, but uh, this is the, the poster exhibition of the conference in Kentucky last year, and this is a very typical anchor poster exhibition. You can see I couldn't actually get all of the posters in the pitch, um, even though I was above it. Uh, the, uh, they, 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 they get like gyms, and this, I think it's a basketball ball, they fill them with poster boards, and uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning through to 8 o'clock in the evening, every hour, posters changed over. So the student, the student gets an hour slot. And it is like this all the time, constantly busy, constantly active, constantly buzzing. Every discipline you can imagine represented. And some, some of the students are incredibly presidential in the way they're, they're sort of talking to their poster. But it is high energy, it is dynamic, it is exciting. Um, of course, there are parallel sort of, um, uh, there, there are sort of talks as well. You know, so usual conference mix of posters and all the presentations, uh, and they're, they're sort of thematised into discipline. Um, so naturally, you know, we, we, we were just overwhelmed by the experience. And, you know, if you ever get a chance to go to one of these conferences, I recommend it. It's not just the energy of the conference, but the diversity of disciplines. It's something that we don't experience very often ourselves as academics, because we go to single discipline conferences. But just, you know, the, the, the opportunity to talk to people from disciplines so different from, from, from my own. And yet realise that in some ways we're all sort of hovering around the same questions, you know, the, the big questions, we're just approaching them from different disciplinary viewpoints. Um, this was in, in Montana in 2010, I don't know if you remember in 2010 there was a, there was a, a volcano in, in Iceland um, which, uh, which uh, meant we couldn't go home. 
So we were meant to be there for four days, we ended up being there for three weeks. <laughs> Which uh, I've never found anybody to, to feel sorry for me. <laughs> Although it was quite stressful at the time. Um, but, the, uh, but it gave us plenty of opportunity to reflect on the experience and to, uh, to, to talk to our students about what they've got from the experience. And also to talk to some of the people who organised the conference in Montana. It was great. We became, because we were in Missouri, Montana, which is tiny, we became like sort of celebrities. <laughs> it, was a, it was a very uh, odd experience um, being exiled from the world. Uh, but, but yeah, so we, we went back, and of course, you know, what, what's the obvious thing to do is, is, is to set up our own conference on graduate research. So we did, we set it up as the British Conference on Graduate Research. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, sh I should probably be more diplomatic with the slide. This is again from up the road. Well, Warwick hosted one of the beakers uh, that we did a few years ago. The first one, uh, I just realised that I'm, I'm playing with my ring in that picture, which is really bad habit. Doing it. <laughs> As we speak, I have to stop doing that. Um, we, 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 we said it up. The, the idea originally, uh, I thought, was you know, I, I know a few people around the sector, and Nick Healy was, was one of them, um, that if I could get you know, sort of um, um, 20 of my friends to bring two students to a conference, it wouldn't be a very big conference, but we could say that was the first conference of British, uh, our first British conference of undergraduate research, and we'd hold it at UCLAN, and then UCLAN will always have that, that honour and that prestige of having. Uh, um, held the first conference. That's how I sold it to my people. You know, you have to invest some money in it, but you'd be able to say you're the first. And they liked that, so we did it. And we, we, we only had, and when we came back um, uh, in, in, in sort of April, and then we held the conference the following April. So we had you know, about, about a year to try and figure out what it was. Um, and we launched it at Isotta, which was convenient for me, and held in Liverpool that year. Um, so in, from launch in September 2010 to April, there was only about a six month period to really build up any interest in this. So we had, we had low expectations. So we weren't really prepared when we had nearly 200 abstract submissions. Uh, we were expecting 50. But all of a sudden, people were finding out about us from all over the place, you know, from, from universities that we had no contact with. And, and I know, I still don't know how they found it, probably through Google. Probably that means that students were out there looking for it. Uh, and very quickly, Beaker sort of took a life of its own. Um, and uh, although it, it started just as a, an idea that uh, I chatted about with, 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 with a colleague of mine on a grassy bank in Montana in the sunshine, uh, to being something that, that existed separately from us. And uh, that was brought home to me when I was putting posters up around our university and people were coming up to me and saying, well, it was a great honor that you've got the British Conference on Graduate Research to come here. And you know, it, it, it's, it's almost as if it was kind of willing itself into existence. So we, we had the first conference at uh, Preston. We followed the same model as ENCA. ENCA moves around to a different university each year. I wanted that to be the same for, for, for Beaker, because otherwise it would always just be new clan doing something. Um, so we went to, to Warwick, where, where this picture was taken the following year. That's 2011. Then we were in Plymouth, uh, Nottingham this year. We're going to Winchester this year uh, uh, in 2015. So April 20th and 21st. Manchester ne next year, Bournemouth the year after that, and actually we've had to draw a line because so many universities want to post this now. And it's been growing every year. You know, we started off with 150 students presenting, we now have 400 students presenting. I don't think we're going to get quite up to 4,000 students like Enka, and I don't know what we've done with it from here. Um, but we're already at that point where most universities are feeling their capacity with this. Um, and again, it's been a really it is a brilliant experience. It's a brilliant experience for the students. For many of them, it's the first conference they've ever been to. They're very enthusiastic about it. They come from every discipline. <coughs> so they, they get that experience of describing their research, articul articulating their research to students from other disciplines, which is, I think, a very powerful uh, lesson for somebody at the start of their academic career. But um, it's also a very good experience for the staff. And something, you know, because none of us, when we set up Rico, knew what to expect. Um, um, the thing that's been said right at the first conference, he said at every conference, somebody always comes up to me and says, this is just like a real conference. I said, well, yeah, but it is a real conference. Um, and if you go onto our website, there are videos of the Warwick Conference and the Nottingham Conference, which give you some insight into, into that experience. 
Um, so for me, this is, this is now one of the things that defines my role. Um, a couple of years ago, Hefke gave us some money to, to really sort of start to establish this properly. So that, that's partly what supports funding us now. The AG Academy have also invested in this too. So I think there's a real will in the sector to, to grow this. Um, and we've been working very closely with our American colleagues as well. Uh, we, this is, for, for the Americans, Beaker has been very important actually. It's just sort of a side note. It's opened up a whole international uh, end to what they do. Um, because of Beaker, uh, directly because of Beaker, because I happened to be on a panel with, with, with uh, an academic from New Zealand in San Francisco a few years ago, uh, and I was presenting something very similar to this. She, she went back and set up the Australasian Conference for Graduate Research, which, uh, and then they got me over as an international consultant, which I was very pleased about. Because, uh, it's, it's very nice when somebody pays for me to go to Sydney. Um, so they're, 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 they're now on their, their third year, so they, they have a curve. There's an all island, island conference on graduate research, and they're starting to spring up all over the world. Um, and I think what this reflects is the extent to which undergraduate research isn't just a, something that happens within the institution, but it's, it's an international movement. It's something that's happening in, in different ways right across the world. And what we're talking about now, um, uh, uh, myself and the Council of Undergraduate Research, who run the, the, the ANCO conference, uh, uh, along with uh, some universities uh, in, in Qatar is, uh, and Australia as well, is setting up a World Congress of Undergraduate Research, which is going to be in November 2016. And you're the first people I've ever told that to as well. So you know, this is something you can get in early and try and get a student to, 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 to that conference in Qatar in November 2016. We think that's going to really start to create a sort of a global movement around undergraduate research. And that's going to be focused on big ideas, big challenges. It's not a conference we're going to have every year, it's a conference we're going to have for say every three or four years to make it a really distinct and special conference. So this is this is something that is that, that has become, I think, very significant for us. And I think one of the measures of that significance is that we now also, in addition to this conference, we also have an annual event in Parliament. Um, uh, this is it, uh, posters in Parliament. Um, uh, and this is uh, uh, in the Jubilee Room, in the, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Parliamentary Room, it's right next to the Visitors Hall, and it's, it's, a, it's a room in, um, in, in Parliament that's often used for events. It has a reputation amongst MPs for being a place where you can get free lunch, so it, it, it get quite a lot of traffic. But the idea behind this, uh, it was inspired again by an American example, uh, they, they have something called Posters on the Hill. Uh, in, in America, they, 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 when I was in Montana, they used to have a National Undergraduate Research Day, and that's now turned into the National Undergraduate Research Week. So you can see how, how, how important it is. Uh, and they bring about 40 or 50 undergraduates every year to DC um, to, uh, uh, to, to present their work to senators and congressmen. Well, we could do the same thing, so we did. Uh, and so we, we host uh, uh, an event in Parliament. Uh, <clears throat> it's grown every year. We've, we're just about to do our third one in a couple of weeks, February the 10th. If anybody wants to come, by the way, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll arrange an invitation for you. I'm afraid it's too late to bring a student because uh, we're at capacity. Uh, but we do have uh, 27 universities represented. Uh, Oxford are there, Cambridge are there, UCL, um, um, Chester, Staffordshire, uh, even a further education college from Newcastle. So it's right across the spectrum. And, and this is something we've always stressed with Bigger. It's always been egalitarian. It's not about saying there are these elite universities and then there are these, uh, what do they call us earlier? Regular universities. <laughs> um, uh, and, and actually, you know, the quality of, of presentation doesn't vary. We have a prize winner every year, and so far, neither Oxford or Cambridge has ever won. Um, so, just to just so show that you know, there, 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 there's real kind of um, uh, depth of quality amongst all of these, no matter which university they come from. Um, so, this has been a, a, a really, really good project for us. Um, and just to sort of conclude, um, this, is, this is the next slide is the most boring picture in the slide, but also the most interesting picture of the slide uh, presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. No, th this is the most boring picture. It's like my vice chancellor. <laughs> you can tell that you know this. You know, in terms of publicity for the university, it's, it's been very good. Um, okay, the next one is even more boring than that. Though. Even more boring than the vice chancellor. Um, this is this is the only picture I managed to sneak when I was in the White House, uh, and I was invited to the White House to talk about this uh, this project, um, uh, and I was I was banished as a foreign national. Couldn't be, I couldn't even go to the toilet without an escort. Well, unfortunately, it was a woman, so I thought it was probably best if I crossed my legs. Um, 
Yeah, um, secret service were 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 but what we're trying to set up is an international research exchange scheme. Um, and we've been doing this already at UFAM and a couple of universities in America. And I know other universities have done similar things as well. But we have a summer internship scheme. A lot of American universities have summer internship schemes. We seem to be a bit of a no-brainer to say, well, why don't we send one of our students to do your scheme? You send one of your students to do our scheme. And we've set this up a few times now. It's always been uh, an extraordinary experience the students and staff involved. I mean, I, I mean, every time I run it, I'm insanely jealous. I mean, at, at that, you know, when you're an undergraduate, the, the opportunity to spend, you know, a couple of months working in a, in a, in a university in another country, expenses paid, <laughs> and, and, and you get a, a salary for it as well. You know. uh, and it's been great for the Americans who've come over to us too. Uh, and it, it, this is something that, that we're looking to expand, so we've just got a uh, sort of signed up and there. Now. And so this is going to be, become a, a, a sort of a, an international scheme run through the Council on Graduate Research and Collaboration with Beaker or both in other countries before we come on board as well. So this really shows you, I think, you know, we can we start off with our classrooms and we start at that level, which is incredibly important. But this connects to things going on in the country, it connects to things going on in the world. And I think there is potential if, if you can persuade your, your vice chancellors and your associate vice PVCs um, uh, to, to invest in this. There's so much potential to um, both create good opportunities for your, for your best and most accomplished students, but also through those students to be ambassadors to promoting uh, uh, greater connections between university research and teaching right through your curriculum. Um, and one of the students we sent over uh, on the, last year, uh, actually, she, she, she was um, uh, this student here, uh, Aisha. Um, I mean, she, I mean, one of the sort of transferable benefits of these things, she was a complete mouse when we first met her, she's now this incredibly confident <coughs> um, uh, We sent her over to, 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 to America last year, but she's, she's now in her fourth year of an MCAM, so like an undergraduate degree that ends with a, with a master's. Uh, she started with us in her second year. By the time she got to this point, she's already patented a, uh, a new water purification um, uh, system. I don't understand experience with science, I don't understand. But what it means is that, that they can purify water much more quickly uh, now than they did before. Uh, I think it's got it down from sort of 20 days to two days or something, something like that. Um, it's a second year undergraduate student has the patent for that. Um, and it's something that will change people's lives. So I think it goes to prove that there is absolutely, and, and you can get similar stories when you go to other universities, like that, and absolutely no limit to what our students can achieve if we give them the opportunity. Okay, that's my pitch. Um, what I thought in the last half an hour we could do is to have a discussion. I'm quite happy to do this either as an open thing, which, which I'm fine with, uh, or we can do it in groups if you're more comfortable with that. I've got some questions. You might have questions of your own. I'm quite happy to be led by you. But I, I suppose what I'm interested in is, is how this might be meaningful to you in Coventry, and what you would see as the, the challenges in terms of taking this forward in, at Coventry. You know, what, what are the barriers? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll leave the, the, the second question for now, so I think it's something you, you, you can probably pick up on your own. Um, uh, but yeah, what are, what are the barriers and what are the opportunities? I mean, how, how relevant is this to Coventry? What are you doing well already? What, what do you think you could do? How, how do you, would you like to do it as an open discussion or would you like to do it in groups? Open discussion. Open discussion, okay. Personally. Okay, okay well, let, let's start with, with uh, what are the barriers? Sort of uh, ten minutes. Are there any other questions? I'm sure. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.